I am Femi OK and you're in the stream. Today, what would happen if the world stopped sending military weapons to the Middle East? Would the number of civilian deaths and refugees go down? We debate the legal and moral responsibility of arming the region. Welcome, good to have you here. Uh, digital producer Malika Balao is here. She did tell me earlier, she already knows what our online community are going to I say do. about How do you know this? They're pacifists. They okay. love peace, and who All wouldn't? Right. And so we do have a lot of comments of people online saying, we just shouldn't be selling weapons at all. And then you have comments like this. This is a perspective via Facebook. This is John who says, countries have the right to defend themselves, though they don't have the right to be aggressive or supply weapons to an aggressive expansionist nation or to persecute their own people. So that's exactly what we'll be talking about today. We want your help to do that. You can tweet us with hashtag AJStream. Hi, I'm Jana Nakhad. I'm an activist and a political organizer, and I'm in the street. Lawyers acting for the campaign against arms trade have accused the UK government of breaching international law by selling missiles and military equipment to Saudi Arabia. They say the weapons may have been used against civilians in Yemen. EU rules on arms exports require member states to deny export licenses if there is a clear risk that those weapons might be used in violation of international humanitarian law. They also call for a ban on weapon sales if there's a likelihood of armed conflict between the recipient and another country. Now, the UK has supplied Saudi Arabia with more than $8 billion worth of arms and military equipment since Prime Minister David Cameron took office. But the British aren't the only ones selling arms in the Middle East. The United States is the leader in weapons transfers to the region, supplying a number of countries including Iraq, the United Arab Emirates, Egypt and Turkey, while Russia has deals with Iran, supplying them with missiles and military technology. So as armed conflicts in the Middle East continue, how much responsibility should be placed on countries who are supplying these weapons? To talk about this, we're joined by Andrew Smith, spokesperson for the Campaign Against Arms Trade, Michael Knights, a research fellow at the Washington Institute, Sam Perlow Freeman, a senior researcher at the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, and right here in our studio we have Joel Johnson, a defense analyst and former vice president of the Aerospace Industries Association. So, gentlemen, welcome. Good to have you all here. Andrew, you're taking the British government to court. Uh, on what basis are you doing that? We certainly are. Yeah. Um, for a number of months now, a whole host of very reputable organisations have accused Saudi Arabia of committing war crimes in Yemen, of breaching international humanitarian law. This is coming from Oxfam, it's coming from Human Rights Watch, it's coming from Amnesty International, it's coming from Doctors Without Borders, it's come from the European Parliament. Now, Saudi is the world's largest buyer of UK arms, and we know for a fact that UK fighter jets are flying overhead in Yemen right now. We know for a fact that UK bombs have been instrumental in the campaign, bombing campaign against Yemen. Now, UK and EU arms export law is very clear on this. Arms should not be licensed where there is a clear risk it might be used to violate international humanitarian law. We want the UK government to suspend all licenses for arms that may be used in Yemen and to urgently investigate if these weapons have been used in any violations of international humanitarian law. Right. Um, uh, hmm. Joe, can this work? Well, I must say, Andrew, but I have one thing in common. My yeah. favorite hero is Don, Don Quixote, uh, back when I was a lobbyist and you tilted at various windmills, and I'm afraid he's tilting at a windmill. I mean, in an ideal world, my industry wouldn't exist. Clearly, it's not an ideal world. Therefore, in an ideal world, you could say, ah, the Saudis are doing such and such. We won't sell them anything. Hey, the Saudis have money. They will simply buy from the Russians. Now, let me remind you that the major suppliers of weapons to both Iraq and Syria, and still to Syria, are the Russians. Uh, they care a lot about human rights, right? Uh, they care a lot about barrel bombs from their acolyte uh, Assad. I mean, the hard facts of life are we, the, the, First place, industry, one should note, sells nothing to anybody without the permission of the U.S. government, a democratically elected government, and a review by our legislature. Sure. So, I mean, we don't make the rules in terms of who we sell to. Right. The, the government makes the rules. We don't even market yeah, I mean, to anybody a without pretty, a license from the government. Go ahead, it's a pretty you. poor moral argument that, it, you, you know, if we didn't sell them, somebody else would. It's true that when it comes to the crunch, 
none of the USA, Russia, Britain, or any of the major powers ultimately uh, restrain themselves by matters of human rights and international law. At least the Western powers have rules that says they ought to, laws that they're supposed to follow, but they're very willing to set them aside when the safety of their arms industry or of a strategic ally is at stake. I think Russia doesn't even pretend to care about those things. But to say that that excuses any individual power, particularly such an absolutely dominant supplier to the region as the US or such a crucial supplier to Saudi Arabia like the UK, I think that's really pretty a, a pretty bankrupt argument. Well, Sam, that, that point that you're raising is actually one that there are a few members of our community also raised. This is a video comment we got from someone named Shireen, and she actually started a petition uh, to call on countries to stop selling arms to Saudi Arabia. So have a listen to what she said. And Michael, I'll direct this one to you. Since March of 2015, Saudi Arabia has led a bombing campaign that has so far resulted in the deaths of thousands of civilians and there has also been a documented use of cluster munitions against civilians in Yemen. And reports by Amnesty International and by Human Rights Watch have also accused Saudi Arabia of committing war crimes. I think given these violations and given the mounting human casualties, it's incumbent upon the international community and on the United States to stop arming Saudi Arabia. So, Michael, the Saudi-led coalition has denied the use of illegal cluster munitions, but I want you to focus on her point about it being on the onus of uh, the supplier to make sure that civilians are then not affected. Yeah, clearly uh, there is a legal and moral obligation on the Western states or any states uh, to ensure that the weapons that they're using uh, are not being used in war crimes uh, or, you know, in any other way against the humanitarian norms. Um, one thing I'd say is, though, that, um, and, you know, I've been on record as saying that the Saudi-led coalition, including, of course, Qatar, the UAE, and other uh, Gulf states, are uh, fighting a pretty brutal air war in Yemen. Uh, but the problem is this. You know, we've uh, heard it uh, previously uh, from, uh, from Sam that the... Uh, uh, it's a poor argument to say that, uh, you know, just because somebody else will arm you, you, um, you know, you shouldn't cut off weapons. That, that's true. But I think in the past it's been true that uh, it is better for Western states to be arming these countries, for them to be dependent on Western states for the continued maintenance and resupply of those weapons, than to rely on, let's say, an actor like China or Russia or uh, North Korea or some other uh, actor. The problem at the moment is that the United States in particular has very limited leverage over some of these Gulf states compared to normal because over the last few years it's been working at cross purposes with many of its allies. As a result, uh, when it comes time to ask a favour or bring some leverage to bear, uh, because we're working on, for instance, uh, a weak nuclear deal with the Iranians, uh, we find that when we want to ask Saudi Arabia to make their air campaign more in line with international norms, we have limited leverage and as a result, we don't tend to push the point. Andrew, what are well, you going to say? I think there's two points to that. I think that, first of all, everything you've just said could be used to justify selling arms to almost anyone in the world, including Iran or including Syria or a whole host of these other thoroughly repressive states. But when it comes to the talk of leverage as well, we always hear this thing about how if we're selling weapons to these countries, it will improve their human rights in some way, shape or form. But Saudi Arabia has been the largest buyer and closest ally the UK, for example, has had in the Middle East over the last 40 years, and it began this year by beheading 47 people. The humanitarian situation there has got worse, and I don't see any evidence that the UK and other Western states selling weapons to Saudi Arabia has made them hold back in any way, shape or form in a bombardment. Well, I don't think that's, 5, that's not the people. point, though. Yeah, but that, that's not really the point I'm making. The point I'm making is that if you have a broader strategic context and foreign policy that supports uh, you having a degree of leverage with an ally, uh, then you stand a better chance at moments like this to be able to turn around to uh, Saudi and the other Gulf states and say, clean up the air campaign. Uh, let's say, allow the US to have a greater role in helping you with but selecting what, striking what leverage, targets. What leverage, uh, what has this leverage actually given Britain and the United States? Well, let me give you the, an example. The theory that 
um, by supplying arms we have leverage or, or that, that stopping the arms supply would, would, would uh, lose us leverage hasn't been tested because we in the West have completely mollycoddled Saudi Arabia. Uh, we very, our leaders very rarely will criticize them in public for the most egregious human rights abuses. They've been allowed to continue spreading Wahhabist ideology, so, so, so which has been a lot of the fuel for Daesh and other terrorist groups around the world. Um, and we continue to supply them with uh, these huge arms supplies, very frequently accompanied by massive bribes. Um, so Sam, let me just so let me let me just exactly ask. What is the leverage Sa here? Sam, let me just ask you um, and, and and bring this up for, uh, as in part of the conversation. We're talking about the entire Middle East region. We're not necessarily just mm. speaking about one specific incident. That's a great peg, Andrew, to get us started in this conversation. But it's a much broader issue. So, for example, I know. Um, uh, uh, Joe, you're going to talk about some leverage, but how about this situation? So we have the Arab Spring, so the US stops supplying military technology to Egypt, and then France steps in. Well, let me go back That's further, the leverage though, the US had that there. when the primary supplier of Egypt was the Soviet Union, mm. free Camp David, there were three Middle East wars. When the U.S. became its major supplier and Israel's major supplier, there have been no wars between those countries since. There have been dust-ups and issues. The fact is we use leverage on both sides. We use arms transfers as leverage on both sides to keep them. We've done the same I think thing. you're getting the direction of causation wrong. Yes, the well, U.S. helped broker a peace deal between Egypt and Israel. That was a great foreign policy success of President Carter. And once that deal was in place, and Egypt was then pulled out of the Soviet sphere and ceased being an enemy to Israel, then the U.S. started supplying arms to Egypt. You can't credit U.S. arms supplies to Egypt as the cause of peace. It was, it was part the other of way the Camp David deal was that we would continue at about $1.5 billion a year for Egypt in arms supplies forever, and, and to Israel also. I mean, it was leverage, and it is leverage. Uh, the other aspect of this vote is that there's a distinct short-termism at the heart of the arms trade. It's not just hypocrisy, it's also short-termism, because if we think about Western relations with, say, Saddam Hussein, he was being armed prior to the Gulf War. Similarly, the regime in Afghanistan was being supported before it got bombed as well. Colonel Gaddafi was getting armed right until a month before the bombing of Libya. And similarly, the West was transferring large quantities of arms to Russia until one month before it invaded Ukraine. So what we're seeing is a really short-term thinking, which is fueling war, and which is only putting more and more weapons into danger zones. That's, uh, that's a peculiar reading of history. We were not supplying Iraq. We were not supplying Syria. We were not supplying Iran once the Shah fell. We were not, you know, these were not countries that we had any leverage over. We'd walked away from them. And the results were not particularly entertaining. One reason the Saudis looked to us is because when Iraq invaded Kuwait, it was us that threw them out. And the Saudis prepared for that by buying U.S. equipment and by grossly oversupplying what they needed in terms of parts and runways so that if the balloon went up, they knew only one country would come and save their posteriors, and that was the U.S. Right. When our F-15 drivers showed up, everything they needed to go to war was there. They didn't have to wait three weeks for C-5s to bring in their stuff because the Saudis knew that it was in their interest to, to build up that kind of it supply from the U.S. That this whole and policy, nobody else is going to bail them out, certainly not the Russians. It seems to me this whole policy is based on the assumption that the autocratic regimes that are currently ruling and that we're supplying with arms, be that in Saudi Arabia or Egypt or wherever, that they're going to be there forever. Obviously, we're trying to keep these horrendous dictatorships in power for as long as possible. Um, but nothing lasts forever. Well, Sam, I'm actually and glad that you said that because that <laughs> leads to a point that someone online made is that things are changing and it's not just about nation states. So this was in response to a question we asked, uh, why do you, people think there's an increase in international arms sales? And so uh, someone named the Citadel, that's their handle, this is what that person said, the increase in international conflicts against pan-national aggressors has something to do with it. Nation states have lost the monopoly on violence. So I, I'm wondering your thoughts and maybe yours, Joel, on are we seeing a rise of non-state actors and is that changing things? Absolutely. And I mean, one of the I used to always be able to say two things when I testified in front of Congress or something on this. One, 
our arms are best when they're never used. I mean, the, the same, we, we did a Cold War for 50 years with nuclear threats, and because each side was equally armed, nothing happened. The problem right now, it, you get asymmetries is when you have major problems. Uh, but the, the, the other issue was, is, as you point out, we've never had a situation with large numbers of non-state actors that you can't apply leverage to. I mean, it, 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 you've, whether it be North Africa, uh, the Sahel, or, or the Middle East, you have a unique phenomenon. I mean, at least whether you... So you're talking of places like Libya, Syria? L Libya, Syria, mm. Iraq. I, right. I, I mean, um, and to some degree, Yemen. So they don't care. I mean, Yemen's they, another they failed state. They don't care about the U.S. Thinks, multiple they don't care about the U.K. They're players. just going to do whatever they... So where will they, where will they get their weapons from then? Well, again, if you look at most of it, it's small arms. So it's not, right. you know, it, 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 which is also hard to control. But it, by the way, you know, from the defense industry perspective, there's no money in that. I mean, right. I think we did, Cypri Bay have a, my guess estimate of U.S. exports of goods and services of defense products last year was about $31 billion. Mm. Oh, I'm sorry, $25 billion or so, give or take a billion, because Cypri only counts big stuff. Uh, uh, I'm using census data, which counts stuff going across. And, and of that, about 300 million is small arms, and most of it went to Europe and, and, and those kind of allies. Most well, of the stuff that's being used is AK-47s out of inventory, some of which are 20 and 30 years old, because they never, AK-47s don't die. It's a, it's a that's, real problem. That <laughs> sounds like an ad. Yes, Andrew, go this ahead. It's mostly Russian gear. Well, no uh, Andrew no and then Sam. Go ahead, Andrew. There's no knowing what's going to happen to these arms once they've left our shores. And at the moment, using the UK as an example, UK government figures show that two thirds of UK arms exports go to the Middle East at the moment and have done for the last few years. The largest buyer of those is Saudi, which, as I said earlier, has bought um, about $8 billion worth since David Cameron took office. But 66% are going to the Middle East and we don't know what's going to happen to them when they leave these shores. And we know one of the reasons that ISIS has so many weapons is because it sees large quantities of weapons as well. It's not just that the lifespan of weapons is longer than the lifespan of governments, and it's also it's also the case that the lifespan of weapons is longer than the lifespan of allies as well. And that's that point I was making earlier, that a number of our allies one day become our enemies the next. Mm. All well, right, so, so Michael, let me, let me just bring in the, the, uh, Russia into this conversation, because we focus on the US and the UK, but, but Russia is a, is a major player as well. Um, how does that impact what's happening in the Middle East in terms of this geopolitics happening too? Look, I don't want to narrow the conversation down too much, but I thought the issue of uh, the Saudi air campaign in Yemen um, was, it's a, it's a great tangible thing for us to talk about here because instead of talking very generally, mm. we can talk about one particular area where one particular number of states are providing weapons to an active conflict uh, in cases where the international community has a great deal of concern. In particular instance, and with the Gulf states generally, you don't necessarily have to worry so much about Russia stepping in and becoming the arms supplier because Russia is increasingly on the other side of the regional alliance structure uh, with the Assad regime, Iran, you know, and so on. So that's not the issue there, but just bringing it back to where we started, because I think that was a great question. I wonder if I can ask Andrew and, and to some extent Sam, you know, uh, what do you think would happen if UK was no longer providing laser guided bombs to uh, Saudi Arabia? Uh, do you think Saudi's, Saudi's behavior in Yemen, its targeting, would be any different? I don't well, think at the there's moment, any despite easy all the talk of it. About... Sorry, Sam, you go first. Yeah, I don't think there's any e easy answer to this. I don't think that. One country cutting off arms supplies is not on its own going to stop a conflict. Um, I think in the short term, there is just absolutely no evidence that either the UK or the US are, are using any of the influence that they supposedly have by virtue of these arms supplies to restrain Saudi Arabia, to push Saudi Arabia and, and the other parties involved towards trying to find a peaceful resolution to the Yemen conflict. But the longer term thing is that for decades, the Middle East has been a vastly overarmed region, that its military expenditure in relation to GDP 
is vastly higher than any other region of the world, and that's only the military spending that we know of. We know we believe that there's an awful lot that's spent off budget as well. But there's these autocratic regimes that are squandering these vast oil resources that they have without any checks and balances that their own people can influence them on huge suppliers of armaments far beyond anything that they need for self-defense, unless it's defense against each other. And we, not just Britain, Britain, the US, Russia, all the major powers have been enablers of that. Now, I'm well, not saying that one country's cutting the, the off the arms supply is going to solve that. The point that the Middle East being been vastly overarmed. Sam, I just want to, I want to focus on that because you said the region is vastly overarmed. And so then the question online is, what do we do about it? So, Andrew, this is a tweet we got. Uh, I think she's being sarcastic, but I'm going to pose this as a serious question. She asked, so then how does one regulate the arms trade? What would your answer be? Well, this is a large part of the problem, which is actually on paper, some of the legislation is relatively strong. It's just that the interpretation of it has been incredibly weak. Now, I know that the arms trade is not going to get abolished tomorrow, and it's a, obviously it's a marathon and not a sprint. But in the short term, the focus on all sides has to be keeping arms out of conflict zones and keeping arms away from Andrew, human rights abusers Andrew, and dictatorships. If, if the campaign against arms trade had its way, would you just get rid of the entire arms trade? Would it be banned? Well. Of course, I think every single one of us wants to live in a world which doesn't have any weapons whatsoever. But I think in the short term, the focus has to be getting arms out of the hands of human rights abusers and away from war zones. Right. And I so, think so another gentlemen, point what to I make find, in all of this... See, gentlemen, this is, is what I find that, difficult uh, about this conversation, Andrew, Andrew, if I, if I may. What I find difficult about this conversation is we're talking about uh, weapons and military technology. That designed to kill people. And then we're talking about moral and legal responsibility. Joel, that seems totally messed up. It's like, are we confused about this? No, I mean, man has been doing this since uh, he invented clubs. I mean, you know, the, 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 for whatever reason, there has been human conflict as far back as the Bronze Age and it, probably the Stone Age. So in the first place, unless you could wave your magic wand and change all humanity, uh, you're gonna have weapon systems. Did you Better ever consider, you've, got, you've had a long history of, of talking about the defense industry, working, supporting, lobbying for them. Is the morality even part of, of their lexicon? Let me put it this way. Uh, in a sense, that's what governments are for. I mean, we, in, in the defense industry... So, no, are you don't care as the defense industry. <laughs> yes, most... It's government's I'd problem. say at least probably a third of the guys in, in management in the defense industry wore uniforms once themselves sure. and are, are very sensitive to not wanting our weapons ever used against our guys and want to have allies out in the field when it comes to it so that they're not the only ones bleeding and dying. That's a sigh. Nobody wants Lockheed Martin or Boeing or Northrop Grumman making foreign policy for the United States. That's why we elect the government. Is Andrew wasting his time? And the Congress. Is, now, is let, me say, let me say one thing to Andrew. Yeah. You know, we just, we do have, an, we, we did negotiate, the U.S. played a leading role in negotiating the arms trade treaty, which took effect in June, if I remember correctly. Yeah. I believe that the Brits are signatories and probably even um, have, have ratified. We are signatories, we haven't mm -hmm. ratified. We won't under, until we change the Senate. The, the <laughs> Russians, the Chinese, the North Koreans have not signed at all. We're not, you know, so there you are. We tried. All right. I used to May say I, 15 years ago, here? let's I, get an arms trade. So, so, so gentlemen, I know, I, I love it when everybody wants to jump in because that means that we're almost at the end of the show. I've got 30 seconds. <laughs> Sam, Michael, Andrew and Joel. Uh, we have more time because I'm going to take you to the post show at stream.outzero.com. Just very briefly, Andrew, I mean, it, it's really going to be a yes or no. Are you going to win this? We certainly hope so. Really? Okay, there's hope there. Um, we are talking about the legal and mor moral responsibility of countries who sell arms to the Middle East. Are they responsible? What are the checks and balances? You can be part of this conversation as well. Hashtag AJStream. Taking online. See you there, hopefully. Stream.azero.com. Thanks for watching, everybody.
again, this is the Streams Online Post Show. We've been having a discussion about the moral and legal responsibility of countries who are selling weapons in the Middle East. I'm going to go to Michael. Michael, because the whole part of what you're trying to do, your research, is to see if you can change behaviour. Um, have you had any successes? Can you see where you're having any impact? Well, let me uh, let me just say that you know this current situation, the war in Yemen. You know, this is really a, should have been a test case for. You know, if you have Western suppliers who have uh, higher human rights standards, uh, supposedly, and you're dependent upon them to uh, run your war effort, uh, you know, surely then with their more precise weapons, with, uh, you know, the Western way of war, which, uh, you know, is focused on lower civilian casualties, our allies might operate in that way. But the test has really been failed. And I think it's been failed in Yemen for a couple of reasons. One, we don't, you know, we don't have that goodwill built up with uh, the allies uh, because our foreign policy currently is a little bit at odds with them over things like the Iranian nuclear deal uh, and, and secondly because they have so a my, multitude so Michael, of different when you're, when you're saying our, our foreign policy you're talking about the US's foreign policy yeah that's right I'm okay. a US citizen now I, right. I'll just say one thing though on you know I heard earlier uh, that we shouldn't be putting weapons into war zones just to bring back down to the level of the fog. I was in Iraq uh, over the autumn and I was working with uh, Iraqi security forces, uh, new units being built up to go and fight ISIS and take them out of cities like Ramadi and Mosul one day. And these young guys, uh, you know, they desperately needed anti-armor weapons. They, des they were desperately afraid of ISIS uh, armored suicide car bombs. And I can't imagine how anyone would want to take the weapons out of their hands or not provide them with the kind of weapons they need to destroy a, you know, a Nazi-like threat like ISIS. I mean, you know, when the US, when the UK was on its knees in World War II, we were extraordinarily grateful to receive yeah. hundreds, thousands of American tanks. I mean, it I pulled us think, back from the brink. I don't think we can be absolutist about that. I don't think that there can be a purely non-military, unarmed response to ISIS, be that from the regional powers or from external powers. Um, but when we look in Saudi and Yemen, you blame uh, US and Western foreign policy. Would you prefer it if we were going to war over Iran's nuclear program? Um, but I, I don't think that's the real reason for the lack of leverage. The British um, government, the British arms companies don't just supply arms to Saudi Arabia. They maintain the Saudi Air Force. Uh, and there's 5,000 BAE employees, employees in Saudi Arabia doing that. And the idea that that, that should give us no leverage um, but the problem this is what is I'm saying. That the this British is, arms this is industry is so this, utterly dependent on Saudi Arabia as this its is number where one customer. completely correct, which is that Saudi Arabia isn't just purchasing military support, it's also purchasing political support. And we've seen that with a couple of examples in the UK, where the UK government has been instrumental in lobbying to get Saudi Arabia laughably onto the UN humanitarian committee. So, so this is where I'm a little uh, lost, committee. gentlemen. But, gentlemen, I'm a little lost here because I said to Michael, do you seen anywhere where you've changed behaviour and then you took off in a completely different direction? You didn't actually answer the question, did you, Michael? No, I absolutely didn't, I, I, yeah. and on purpose. But uh, if you want, I can, uh, I can try now. I like, this is what, yeah, um, what I really came back to was that this should be the, the test case where the modification of an ally's behaviour because they had Western suppliers with best Western human rights, Western technology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you said that. Michael, have you seen any change in right. behaviour? No. Is that your answer? No. No, absolutely. No. That's the point. Right. This should have been okay. the perfect test case. All right, moving on. Malika, what do you have? Well, this is a perspective that I will pose to you, Sam. This is Lena. And, and taking into account what you said a little bit earlier, she kind of picks up on that and she says, countries are selling arms knowing perfectly well what they'll be used for and to whom they will be sold. And I know that can be disputed, but that's her view. Then to go ahead, she says, and claim how utterly despicable and dangerous a country or a group is behaving is pathetically hypocritical. So are, is this just an exercise in hypocrisy that governments are, are playing? I, I, I think it is to a large extent. I think the problem is that there are these uh, regulations in place. There is an arms trade treaty. Uh, there's a, an EU common position on the arms trade, which is considerably stronger than the arms trade treaty. And I won't say it's had no effect. I think that the problem is that countries are too willing to set that aside 
whether it's because of a particular strategic partner or because, uh, as in the case of Britain and Saudi Arabia, the strength of a country's arms industry, possibly even its viability in the long term, depends on making that custom. And I think on maintaining that custom. So it is hypocritical, and I think it's based on a fundamentally skewed set of priorities. It's the tail wagging the dog. We must have an arms industry, so we must supply to Saudi Arabia and let them get away with whatever it is, maintain this horrendously autocratic regime in power. Uh, it, it's just a skewed set of priorities. Joel, has, have you seen this kind of conversation before? other times in our history. Oh, you know, for 30 years. I yeah. mean, the, 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 and, and you know, by and large, you know, I, the trouble is I I, I'd have to go outside of the Middle East domain for the moment. But I mean, if you look at uh, Turkey, Greece, if you look at, uh, well, Israel, Egypt, obviously, if you look at Pakistan, India, by and large, the U.S. has been a major supplier. India is more, is more recent. And we have provided a balance, very often, among other things, just the fact that, as has been pointed out, when you buy a, a, an American or a British weapon system, you have a relationship for 20, 25 years. Mm. Their people come to the U.S. We've had, you know, you go to any of the schools in the U.S., you'll have a Palestinian, not a, take the back back, you'll have a Turk, you'll have a Pakistani, you'll have an Egyptian, you'll have an Israeli, all in the same class. They get to know each other as light colonels. They become generals. There are a number of instances where major flare-ups have been stopped because these guys could get on the phone and they trusted each other because mm. they had the same weapons, they'd been to the same school, they drunk beer together, right. even, even the Arab <laughs> Oh, don't even, la, 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 <laughs> not yeah. listening, not listening, not listening. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, fighter Possibly pilots are fighter pilots. <laughs> and like there, you, 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 you build a relationship, right. yeah. you know, and, and you got to step back in, in perspective. Right. The Yemen thing is all of six months old. I mean, we've had a relationship for 20, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years since Roosevelt with the Saudis. This mm -hmm. is the first time you've had the train go off the tracks. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the first time they've gone and fought anybody other than working with us in the Iraq situation, Iraq Kuwaiti situation. So, you know, one glitch does not a massive historical trend one show. One glitch is an interesting way of putting it. Uh, I mean, there, there has been a lot of cases where countries supplied with Western arms have gone to war or have been, while we were supplying with them um, with arms, maintaining incredible degrees of repression uh, over their own populations or over other people's population. What a wonderful peace there is between Israel and Egypt. Israel, with $3 billion a year of American arms for free, has been maintaining a brutal occupation of the Palestinian people for the best for nearly 50 years. And U.S., uh, insofar as it has tried, has been singularly unsuccessful in changing Israeli behavior in that regard. You can't uh, just write Yemen down as one little glitch in an otherwise a uh, wonderfully happy and successful history of the global arms trade. Gentlemen, I've really enjoyed this very robust conversation between you. So Sam and Michael and Andrew and, Andrew and Joel, uh, thank you very much for being part of the stream today. Really appreciate your takes. And thank you, audience, for watching. Take care, everybody.